As subscribers are no doubt already aware, I have about 20 films or so underway. Ten of which are a point-by-point -point rebuttal to Phil Webb's series on moon rocks, as well as a discussion of the new material regarding the Apollo samples. Now it appears that Webb has moved on to his next topic, radiation. So far, the indications are promising. All he can do is ignore most of the evidence and downplay the rest with selective quotes and word playing. Actually, I don't know why he even bothers. Outside his short list of adoring fans, hardly anyone is watching. In the six months since he began his attack on Exhibit D, his first video in the series has received little over 400 views. My videos typically get that in a day. What? Does he think he's going to single-handedly stop the growing numbers who no longer believe the moon landings? Dream on. Not even the Mythbusters could stop that. Regarding radiation, in all honesty, I had not planned on addressing this subject until my point-by-point -point response to Astro Brand 2's answering, or more accurately, dodging of my 32 questions. But because Phil Webb has touched on this and has echoed virtually everything Astro Brand 2 said, I feel the need to at least get the radiation questions out the way. In addition to skipping past his usual cheap shots, I'll also spare you Astro Brand's apparent Clint Eastwood fetish. Jay Windley and Robert Brainig claim that major solar flares can be predicted before they occur and thus postpone a moon flight to a safe date. Do you believe that? I don't know, but if they can, good for them. I would probably care more about this if I was going to be an astronaut one day. So, you don't know. Fair enough. News flash for you, they can't predict them. Even to this day, the ability to accurately predict when a solar flare will spurt up does not exist. You state you would only worry about this if you were going to be an astronaut someday. Yet 24 people claim to have been to the moon, and would most certainly have had to worry about this. So tell me, why would, as you put it, prominent and highly qualified Apollo defenders claim that NASA had the ability to predict major solar flares before they occur, when even today, we still don't have that kind of technology? Yet Phil Plate and Noah's John McKinnon both claim that major solar flares are not predictable. Do you believe that? If you have faithfully represented the views of the people in these two questions, then I would say that they probably all believe what they claim and it appears that they disagree. Am I bruised yet? Ah, the penny drops. Yes, they obviously do disagree with Brannig and Windley's claims of predictability. I find it interesting how you won't say whether or not what these individuals say is factual, rather, you say that they believe what they say is true. Just so that there is no doubt that I am indeed accurately representing the views of these individuals, let's see what they wrote. Phil Plate wrote, In a sense, the astronauts were indeed risking their lives to go to the moon, because solar flares are not predictable. And I showed John McKinnon's paper prominently in my 23-part series on space radiation. He not only claimed you cannot predict this stuff, as a member of NOAA, he had historical proof that you can't. I'm sure you're familiar with the major solar flares that occurred in August 1972. The sunspot that these flares in question came from was known as Region 331. On page 28, McKinnon wrote, The activity from Region 331 was not covered in any long-range forecasts. He showed the weather forecasts which clearly state that only low solar activity was predicted for August 2nd, 1972. Think about that. Windley and Brainig claim these guys had the ability to predict major solar flares in advance and could move moon flights to a safe date, and yet their predictions missed the Godzillas of all solar flares? Now answer the obvious. Is it or is it not possible to predict life-threatening solar flares in advance before sending people to the moon? <coughs> 
Radiation biologist Dr. Eleanor Blakely states that aluminium shielding, like what was used on Apollo, would worsen the radiation problem because it increases the risk of particle fragmentation. Is she right? I have seen that video. Since she's one of the people your hero Ralph Rene would call a heavily credentialed gas bag. Correction. The only people Rene called gas bags were scientists, or in some cases, self-proclaimed scientists, who opposed his theories but offered no valid reason for their objections. Much the same way, my opponents have earned themselves the title Propagandists for the high levels of propaganda that they spread all over the internet. Then, I would tend to believe what she says. Was there some point in your including this? Oh, and by the way, you didn't mention that she was making these comments with respect to a mission to Mars. Oh, and don't worry. Unlike you, I have no need to quote mine. I have no need to quote mine. Quote mine. Quote mine. Didn't I? I showed her statement in full in my video on this subject. Eleanor Blakely, a radiation biologist for the Life Sciences Division at Lawrence National Laboratory, also spoke of ethylene shielding as well as the possibility of shielding spacecrafts with its actual fuel tanks. Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, how difficult it would be to shield a spacecraft or even a spacesuit against uh, different types of radiation. Yes, you ask another good question. The only problem is that particles undergo a process called fragmentation. So if a particle comes in and hits like an aluminum shielding, you, it actually fragments into an array of particles of lower atomic number. So you actually have a higher fluence on the inside than you would have on the outside. So there's been recent study by NASA of the materials of the spacecraft, because hydrogenous materials uh, like um, shielding, polyethylene shielding can reduce just by the different Z of the impact of the uh, ions coming in from space. So shielding has limitations from that point of view. However, I talked to an astronaut that he, his light vision is that, um, of course, what you want to do is minimize the exposure to Mars. So he, he's a big proponent of other kind, alternative propulsion. And he would like to put the propulsion material, which is hydrogenous, in big tanks around the spacecraft. Now that would really ruin your view, but it certainly would shield you. And so they have lots of things under study just to examine different alternative shielding. Obviously, Apollo could never have been shielded with its own propellants, as the majority of which was spent right at the beginning of the trip. It should also be noted that Apollo used aluminium shielding, which, by Dr. Blakely's admission, would increase the risk of particle fragmentation and thus worsen the radiation problem. So if a particle comes in and hits like an aluminum shielding, you, it actually fragments into an array of particles of lower atomic number. So you actually have a higher fluence on the inside than you would have on the outside. And before you try anything funny, I asked her how these statements apply in regard to an Apollo mission. And she confirmed that the particle fragmentation problem also stands. I asked her, would this be the case on an Apollo spacecraft? After all, Apollo used aluminium shielding. And she said, Indeed, aluminium shielding is what most spacecrafts are made of. And the issue of charged particles fragmenting upon impact with aluminium to charged particles of lower atomic number can create a complex radiation field within the spacecraft. I would tend to believe what she says. I would tend to believe what she says. I would tend to believe what she says. So, you agree with her that aluminium worsens the radiation problem? Or do you change your stance now that you know it applies to Apollo Craft 2? Isn't it true that aluminium shielding on the International Space Station, due to the fragmentation of cosmic rays, increased the daily radiation doses from 0 0.027 rem per day to 0 0.1 rem per day? Very interesting. And since astronauts on the space station are generally there for much longer than any of the Apollo missions lasted, this might be something of significance. 
By the way, did any of them die or get serious radiation sickness from this? Unlike you, I have no need to quote, I have mine. No need to quote, mine. quote mine. Straw man, I never claimed the ISS crews died from this increased particle fragmentation. I simply showed this article because it agrees with what Dr. Blakely stated, that aluminium worsens the radiation problem. John Malden and Gene Parker state that the typical radiation doses in low orbit are 10 rem per year, which is 0.027 rem per day. The aluminium walls of the space station elevated that dose to 0.1 rem per day. This is approximately 3.7 times the doses that are normally received in low orbit. And that's just on the ISS travelling in low orbit. Now suppose it was travelling through regions, or during events, where the doses range from tens to hundreds to even thousands of rem per hour. In the 1961 issue of Space World, Dr. James Van Allen stated, A living organism cannot survive this level of radiation damage. Hence, all manned spaceflight attempts must steer clear of these two belts of radiation until adequate means of safeguarding astronauts has been developed. And that, owing to the great penetrability of the high-energy protons therein, effective shielding is quite beyond engineering feasibility in the near future. Hence, the inner zone must be classed as an uninhabitable region of space as far as man is concerned. The outer zone is much more difficult to avoid. Are Van Allen's claims of killer radiation true? I'll take a moment with this one. First of all, congratulations. I think that's the most recent article you have ever quoted Van Allen from. That was, what, two, three years after his original discovery of the Van Allen belts, when still relatively little was known about them. False. If you are going to claim to be an expert on aerospace history, try showing knowledge of such. It is commonly stated that Van Allen's discovery of the radiation belts was in 1958 with the Explorer 1 satellite. This is not entirely true. The first detection of the radiation belts was as early as 1952, back when Van Allen was sending up raccoons into space. These did not have enough power to get into orbit, but they made it high enough to encounter radiation levels higher than Van Allen had anticipated. Yes, years later he would put Geiger counters in the Explorer satellites. When Van Allen made this statement, he had thoroughly mapped the belts with the Explorer satellites and Pioneer probes, not to mention the Sputnik satellites and Lunar probes, whose Russian owners happily shared their data with Van Allen. Van Allen stated that adequate shielding of manned spacecraft had not been developed. When he made that statement, both the Americans and the Soviets had made two manned flights. The US with Shepard and Grissom, and Russia with Gagarin and Titov. Just like Apollo, Mercury was a lightweight capsule that could only operate with a low-pressure pure oxygen atmosphere. The Russians since Vostok, through to Soyuz, have always had the luxury of flying in a sea level pressure nitrogen oxygen atmosphere, hence the need for thick walls to contain it. If not even the superior hull Russian capsules could offer adequate shielding, how could the lightweight American capsules possibly offer adequate shielding? He remained very active in space exploration for another 25 years. How come you don't have any more recent quotes than this? I do show more recent statements, such as E.E. E. Kovalev's 1983 article and John H. Molden's book.